The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody. This is Jessica Almy at CSPI. Thank you for joining us for a healthy checkout subcommittee call. Um, today we're going to, we have a special guest. Um, we are going to um, talk about the role of distributors and manufacturers, primarily distributors, in um, checkout and retail marketing. Um, and we're really happy to have guests on the call today. Um, Katie, can you advance my slide, please? Thank you. So um, before we get started, I just wanted to highlight that CSPI's um, study that we had talked about on previous calls, it has been released, and you can access it at cspinet.org slash healthycheckout.html. Um, and we have gotten some press on the study, but we would love to have our partners share it on social media um, and otherwise help get the word out. And we're also asking our supporters and everybody on the call to tweet to Bed Bath & Beyond and ask them to stop selling candy at checkout. So there's a model tweet um, on the slide. If you're on Twitter right now, you can tweet. It'd be great to have your support. So we're really happy today to have Rhonda Walsh and Craig Willingham from the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's Shop Healthy program on the call. They're going to talk about how they've been working with distributors in New York City to get healthier options at checkout. After they conclude their presentation, Juan Vila of the Food Trust will talk about his role in working with distributors in um, Healthy Corner Store Project in California. And then we'll open up the call for everyone on the line to ask the questions of the speakers and to make any announcements that you or your organization may have around checkout. Um, it's 1.03 now, and we have to wrap up by 2 o'clock. Um, so I will pass the, the call over to Rhonda and Craig for their presentation. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, so as Jessica introduced us, my name is Rhonda and this is Craig. We work for the New York City Department of Health. Um, heard most of your voices on these calls previously. It's nice to be able to present to you. And uh, our group sits in the Center for Health Equity at the New York City Department of Health. And so we are working to reduce health disparities. Today we're going to talk to you a little bit about our food distributor work and um, hope you can pass some ideas on to everybody else. And so Shop Healthy New York City, to give you sort of a broad overview of what our program looks like before we dive into our distributor work, uh, is a three-prong approach. And this was developed over years of work. We've been doing food retail work in New York City for approximately eight years now. And previously, uh, what we did is we just worked with retailers. So we just worked with corner stores and supermarkets. And um, when we were doing that work, we realized that there were huge gaps where a corner store would say, I'm really looking for the baked chip or I'm really looking for um, a healthier option and the supplier is not getting back to me. And so we started calling these suppliers and distributors, realizing that if we talk to a supplier and distributor, we can actually ask them to change their practices and how they market and how they sell and how they stock the foods within these stores. And so that is where we came up with that second prompt. And then the third prong to our approach is working with community groups. So all of this work really is not sustainable without the support of community. And so we partner with community groups across New York City to actually partner with the store so that when we move on with our work to another corner store, we won't be there forever. The hope is that the community will continue to support that work and the changes that have happened at the store level and make sure that the store makes money. So that's sort of our overview of what the work is. And now I'm going to hand it over to Craig to talk about the distributor supply chain. So beginning the process of working with distributors really came down to understanding what the landscape of distribution is like when it comes to corner stores, bodegas, grocery stores, and supermarkets. And uh, we spent a fair amount of time just trying to map out you know, who are the players and what are the different types of distributors and you know, why certain retailers deal with certain distributors primarily as opposed to others. And what we ended up discovering was that there's a kind of a tier when it comes to distribution for food retail. And 
the way that it works is that you have the processor and manufacturer, and some of you may already be aware of some of these points, and the processor and manufacturer actually provides products to other distributors in the tier. And with, product, with manufacturers and processors, they have a format called DSD, direct store distribution. And within that, you have companies that sell beer, soda, bread, dairy, confectionery, cookies. And DSD distributors really go directly from the manufacturers to the store. And they really cut out the middleman. And they also do a lot of the marketing and merchandising that you see in stores. After that, you see broadline wholesalers who really buy from manufacturers and processors. And they sell their own private label products as well as a whole range of products by major manufacturers whose names you would recognize. And after that, you have cash and carry wholesalers, which really the distinction is that the store owner will go to the store and actually purchase the item and take it back to the store as opposed to having it delivered by the distributor. And within these formats, in our region, there are several players. For wholesale distributors, we have Crasdale, Bazudos, CNS, and White Rose, and these are just a few. And for the stores that we worked with, Crasdale was one of the primary distributors that they tended to use. And Crasdale is more of a broad line distributor that sells products by a range of manufacturers, and they also have their private label products. Uh, Bazudos, CNS, and White Rose are also you know, very large manufacturers that deal in the northeast and up and down the eastern seaboard. With cash and carry, we have Jetro, which Jetro is a distributor that's also uh, around the country but really concentrates on the East Coast, Costco and Sam's Club. And what we found is with the corner stores and bodegas, almost all of them purchase their products from Jetro. And it's the sort of thing where it's, it's a matter of convenience. If they run out of something in the middle of the day, they can drive to Jetro, restock, and bring it back as opposed to having to place an order and wait for the distributor to deliver it the next day. And lastly, the direct store delivery distribution are, again, names that you may be familiar with, uh, Nestle, Coca-Cola, Frito-Lay, the sort of obvious big brands that really do a lot of merchandising in supermarkets, corner stores, and bodegas. And in New York, specifically, we have regional players like Marlowe Candy, Sweet Rainbow, Big Apple Nuts, and All-American Candy. And these distributors really supply prepackaged bags of nuts, candy mixes, and little plastic toys mixed with candy and bags that go at the checkout line. And who are the retailers? Uh, this is a definition of who our bodegas are and who our supermarkets are. Our uh, bodegas have a limited selection. This is how we identify what they are. A limited selection, they have higher prices. They have smaller quantity inventory at higher per unit price. Uh, supermarkets have a broad selection, lower prices, large inventory at lower per unit price. So why focus on the checkout line? Uh, as I've talked about on previous calls, we uh, did a pilot checkout line, and everyone asks the same questions. Why is this important to us? I'm preaching to the choir here, but replacing typical checkout line foods, high in fat, salt and sugar with healthier items can help customers make smarter snack choices. So as many of you will know, there's a whole number of different practices that are at play when it comes to marketing and placement of products at the checkout aisle. And what we found is what everyone finds is that the checkout aisle is populated by you know, high salt, high fat, high calorie items. And this is a diagram put together by Front End Focus that some of you may have seen before. Front End Focus is a group that's uh, supported by Coca-Cola, Mars, and Time Warner. And this is what they recommend for the retailers that are in their group to do when it comes to stocking the checkout line. And as you can see, the vast majority of product there is candy and gum and uh, sugar-sweetened beverages on the end cap. And these are supported by slotting fees, which, you know, again, many of you on the call are probably familiar with this, where you know, there's a financial incentive for store owners to actually make sure that this sort of product layout is what customers see when they're checking out. So to kind of get our own voice out there with respect to retailers, we put together a planogram based on what we would like to see at the stores. And uh, as, again, many of you probably know, the DSD distributors specifically have a planogram that they use that dictates what goes on what shelf and what goes in what part of the store. 
And we saw this at many of the stores that we visited, and we thought that you know this is a very simple diagram that they put together. There's no reason why we can't put together our own. So we took it upon ourselves to come up with a way to describe to store owners, this is what we would like to see when you're working with us. And it's a very simple description of what can be put on shelves, and you know it gives store owners a whole range of choices, not just saying, you know, have brand A, brand B, nuts, dried fruit, non-food items, et cetera. So we've, the store that we work with, we give them this planogram and we suggest that this is something that they implement in their store. And what you can't see, probably because it's too small, in the bottom left-hand corner are standards. And so that is a criteria that helps people understand what makes an item healthy by our New York City food standards. And so we try and um, break it out there so that the store is able to identify foods that are healthy rather than having us always tell them this food is healthy because it has enough fiber and not enough fat. Um, so if you can read that, it's right there. But we'll touch on that in a little bit as well. So here's an example of our beverage planogram. And the beverage planogram really shows that what we would like to see is you know, water or low-calorie beverages at eye level. And we know that the eye level merchandising and marketing really you know, takes advantage of that desire for impulse buys. And you know, what we really want our stores to do is to replace you know, sugar-sweetened beverages that are in the eye level with water and low-calorie beverages so that you know, this, it's, it becomes the default for customers to purchase the healthier items as opposed to you know, the unhealthy items. So how to work with distributors? This is the big question, and um, we've definitely had a learning curve with this. Uh, first, identify a champion at the corporate level. So there's obviously a sales rep that we see at all the stores and that visits and delivers uh, the product. But identifying the champion, so whether that's somebody in marketing, somebody in community relations, somebody in sales, higher level, um, and then that champion will partner with you to make these healthy changes at the store level. level and build a relationship with the sales force. So this is really important. Uh, we've been doing this work for over two years now, and the first year was really establishing relationships and really understanding uh, how the distributors did their work. So rather than coming in and saying, we want you to change it all and do this and that, it's really getting an understanding of what they're doing, why they do it, like these planograms. They have a, um, sales reps, for example, that actually make uh, revenue and sales based on what's sold in a store, and so you can't go in and just change all the unhealthy chips for healthy chips because that sales rep, his income will be directly affected by it, and so a chip company is likely to not go ahead and change the whole planogram with you um, because of that. So those are some examples of like building that relationship and just understanding why these companies do what they do. And ownership over product display in store. And so letting the store owners know that they have ownership over their product display and, um, and then talking to distributors, distributors about that and creating that relationship so that they can actually work out a deal. And repurpose industry practices. Like Craig showed you, we had a bunch of planograms that industry has created and we've just repurposed those and put in healthy items and we can easily do all those sorts of things on the public health end. What to expect? So when you start reaching out to the distributors, if you've already started doing this, you can expect many cold calls and long periods of wait in between phone calls. So you'll call, it may take a month or two to get a call back or to get in touch with the right person, and that's normal. Question on how checkout changes will affect profit. And so this is the first question a distributor is going to ask you. They're going to say, how is this going to affect my profit? Will I make more money? Am I going to lose sales, right? Excitement? Yeah, I mean, one of the things we found is that store owners or distributors would actually be very excited at first when learning about the program and learning about the work that we're doing. But once they actually started to see the changes that we were trying to make, especially when it came to checkout, you know, they were a little bit taken aback about, you know, oh, is this going to be actually taking out all of my, you know, unhealthy products or, and replacing them with healthier products? And they were really concerned. So. We found that you know it was important not to get panicky when you started to get resistance from distributors after you start implementing it, and just to stay the course and really talk them through the process again. Mm -hmm. And lots and lots of explaining of the concept. Uh, these distributors, their main goal is to make money, and so trying to explain the process on our end. 
what we're doing, how we're trying to work with them. We're not trying to make their job more difficult and explaining around the corporations. You talk to one person, you have to talk to another, you get invited for a meeting, um, and it goes on and on. So, you know, for the purpose of this call and for the work that we all are involved in, you know, what we want to do is to work with distributors to make sure that we can make changes at the checkout line. And I'm sure some of the people involved with these initiatives are on the call, and I, I applaud you. And, but I wanted to highlight these three because they showed an example of three different approaches. And with respect to Martins in Virginia, you have a public-private partnership between Martins, Fit for Kid, and the Richmond City Health District. And it shows that you know, different groups can come together to make these sorts of healthy checkouts happen. Regarding hy V, this is something that was driven by Wellmark, and they brought in Blue Zones to do a Blue Zone project throughout Iowa. But you know, this is an organization that you know is concerned with health and is connected with different stores to make sure that the entire community starts to make changes. And you know, bringing in Blue Zones really had a, had the effect of making changes throughout the store, but specifically at the checkout line. And again, it, this this was something that wasn't driven by a nonprofit or government. This is something that was taken on by you know a healthcare provider. And lastly, Harmons. Harmons really took it upon themselves through their retail dietitians and also the store leadership to make these changes in their stores. And it's the sort of thing where you rarely do you see stores taking it upon themselves. There are a few big examples that are currently happening, you know, in the UK and also a few here in the States. But you know, to have stores take this upon themselves is something that ideally the work that we're doing will build the, the base for and start to, you know, increase the support for these sorts of things overall. So our approach and standards, um, lots of calls people ask us, uh, how do we identify what food is healthy and what food is not healthy? Uh, Executive Order 122 has established the New York City Food Standards with the goal of improving the health of all New Yorkers served by city agencies. So New York City has set standards, uh, and this is how we identify what foods are healthy and what foods are unhealthy. We use our food vending standards for checkout lines specifically because it's all snack food. And if you can read this here, you can also see if you just look on the New York City Department of Health website and just say New York City Food Standards, you'll easily be able to find all of our standards. And we have several different standards that apply across the city in different areas. And I'm not going to read through these because I think you can read through them on your own. So our approach, when it came to actually implementing our Healthy Checkout Line pilot, we decided to put together four different materials that were developed to help market the Shop Healthy program. And we really did a lot of research in trying to figure out you know, what was going to work the best. And we decided that we definitely needed a sign that would go throughout the store to prompt customers to go to that line. Because one of the things I found in talking to some of the other people who've done healthy checkout lines is that often you know, when customers got to the checkout line, they simply just wanted to look for the shortest line. They weren't even thinking about going to the healthy checkout line. And with that in mind, we wanted to make sure we were making customers aware that this option exists before they actually get to the point where they're getting ready to check out. Uh, what we also wanted to do is to make sure we had some reinforcing signs at the point of sale. And so we decided to make a few arrows that we put on the floor in, the, in front of the checkout aisles. And what we actually found anecdotally is that many customers would go to that line because they thought that was the line they were supposed to go to just because the arrow pointed in that direction. And they thought maybe it indicated a faster line or the only line that was open. And lastly, we cre recreated two point of sale checkout line signs, uh, one, one portrait and one landscape format. And the reason why we did this is because the checkout lines in New York, and you'll see this on some of the photos after this, uh, tend to be very small in the stores that we're working with. Even though they're, they're supermarkets, the amount of space that these stores have, you know, it's really remarkable that, that they're able to really do what they do. Oftentimes, as soon as you get out of the interior aisles of the store, you maybe have five feet before you're already at the checkout area. So we wanted to make sure that we had signs that were both adaptable for larger checkout sections and smaller ones. And these are some pictures of the materials in the store um, just to give you an idea of how large they are and what they look like. And this is a before and after. Before is on the left-hand side. 
uh, a lot of candy and nuts displayed. It's a typical checkout line if you've ever seen one in New York, and hopefully they look similar, somewhat similar around the country. On the right-hand side, uh, we're able to keep some of the nuts, and they are on the top shelf. And then in the middle, uh, it's the little fruit cups, uh, granola bars that meet our standards, some raisin packets, some fruit juices, and then waters on the bottom. And then on the top, you can see a basket of fruit. And I think that there's other hanging um, healthy nut options, like sunflower seeds. And, um, and so we have some intensive survey results. Uh, we were able to evaluate this with a control checkout line to understand if people selected one checkout line versus the other. And then also we did an inventory uh, before and after purchases. And we do hope to be able to report on this in um, early FY15 as to whether or not the checkout lines had an effect on purchases. And we will happily share this with the group uh, once we have that information. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Juan Vila. Um, and as Jessica uh, mentioned, I work for the Food Trust. I'm a project coordinator for the consulting team. So I began uh, working with corner stores in the uh, Philadelphia Healthy Corner Store Initiative. And now I work with corner stores nationwide. Um, doing consulting and helping other organizations start healthy corner store initiatives. So I just wanted to share this uh, this picture with everybody first. Uh, I think it really demonstrates the idea of the healthy checkout line and uh, choice architecture. Um, so as you can see, um, you know, uh, Abu has chosen to put fresh fruits uh, right in, in the front so that Homer uh, chooses those, those items instead of the donuts he would normally go for. So I thought it was a really good illustration of um, how you can really affect the way people purchase. Um, through the point of sale changes. Um, I'm going to share with you a few uh, slides. Uh, this is an example of a purchasing guide that we've put together for um, an initiative that I've been helping to um, uh, helping with TA in, in San Jose. So we actually put together this purchasing guide for store owners, which really details um, where they can find the healthy products that we're asking them to introduce in their stores and also gives them some details about, um, as Rhonda um, had mentioned, exactly what is considered a healthy product. Um, so this is just the overview for the San Jose um, Healthy Corner Store Initiative. So the campaign is called Good to Go. Um, it has a very heavy focus on uh, grab and go items. So the tagline for the Good to Go campaign is fun, fast, fresh. Uh, these are items that customers uh, can grab quickly. Um, they're fresh. They're healthy. Um, we really focus on the convenience factor instead of the health factor. So we really, um, we know people realize that certain items are healthier than others and still choose the unhealthy items sometimes. So we really wanted to go with the concept that um, makes people really uh, want to grab these items. So they're things that are packaged uh, in very colorful ways, uh, things that are appealing to kids, um, but that are also healthy. So they use a lot of the same tactics that, um, say, Doritos or uh, you know something like that would use. Uh, so they use the, the very appealing packaging in order to really grab people's attention. Um, so as you can see, uh, we ask stores to choose two healthy food categories and then introduce two new products in each of those categories. In addition to that, we ask them to introduce two products, which are grab and go. So these are, uh, as I mentioned, things that uh, customers can just really easily grab and eat. Um, and then we also have a bonus category. So if stores um, introduce items that are locally grown, uh, we, they get bonus points towards their um, conversion so they can receive equipment and things like that in order to help them stock the healthy items. And this is the product menu. So this uh, really details what is considered a healthy item. It breaks down each food category. And then it has the definition of what uh, that that category, uh, what products in that category would be considered healthy. So um, I'll start, just start talking a little bit about some of the connections we've made with distributors in San Jose. Um, so one of the um, as uh, one of the things that was mentioned earlier is it takes a lot of cold calling. So basically, the way that we connect with distributors is to research all the distributors that offer their services within an area, and then we just really start calling them, um, we uh, talk to them about what our program is about, what our goal is, how we're trying to connect the distributors with corner stores, 
and you know, then we start to talk a little bit about how they can um, either deliver to the stores or provide healthier options in their warehouses in order to um, to have these healthier options that store owners can choose from. So this is one of the distributors we've identified in San Jose. They're called Chef's Choice. Uh, they're a really great uh, company. They offer very uh, fun packaged items. So they have you know uh, fruits and vegetables that are pre-cut and then put into little bags, which are appealing to uh, to kids and really they they try to uh, use some of those tactics I was talking about, so uh, creating that appealing packaging. Um, as you can see, they do have a fairly high delivery minimum. So this one uh, has $150 minimum for delivery. Um, this is one of the issues that uh, we've run into most often with uh, talking to distributors about delivering to stores, uh, just that most corner stores can't really meet that uh, minimum for delivery. It's just above their their ability to uh, to pay that much because uh, they're not really stocking that much uh, that much produce in order to to meet that minimum. Uh, one way we've worked around that uh, for this particular distributor, uh, we've started to pilot a drop-off uh, system where they will drop off um, the minimum delivery to one store in our network, and then the rest of the stores in the network will actually pick up the produce from this uh, this store that's chosen that's um, volunteered to be sort of a drop-off point. So it's a cooperative buying system. It's still in the pilot phases, so we're still tweaking it and seeing um, how we can really make this work and make it sustainable on a larger scale. Uh, but so far, it's really worked pretty well. These are some of the examples of uh, products that the distributor carries. So for the owners of sake, we've broken down exactly how many units are in the case and then also how much the cost is for each unit. Um, we also included the shelf life, uh, so this is very important when you're talking to small store owners, um, how long these items will actually um, be uh, be able to stay on the shelves or in the refrigerator. Um, usually it's a very small turnaround time. Store owners have to really sell these items quickly um, in order to avoid that shrink that's going to make them lose money. Um, and as we all know, the the lifeblood of uh, this these stores is that they make money off of the products that they introduce. So uh, we really want them to be successful with the items that they're introducing. We want them to be aware of how long they're going to last in order to um, truly make it profitable for the store owners. Um, again, other examples of some really fun packaged items. So these are all really great, um, really great little uh, cut fruit packages. Uh, my favorite is actually this pineapple one. It's kind of like a push-up um, pineapple wedge, so it uses the concept of a push pop. Um, other ones that we've found are uh, carrot sticks that are in packages which are similar to cheese and crackers, so it'd be carrot sticks with a little low-fat ranch dip, um, and really kind of, uh, you know, kind of uses those same tactics, so it's a really fun little package that kids can grab. Um, and again, we have the case price, um, also how many units are in the case, and the shelf life for each of those units. Um, as we had mentioned, there are also wholesale distributors that we partner with. Uh, so Pitco is the large one in San Jose that most of the store owners stock the rest of their items in. So Pitco carries things like cereal, um, canned goods, things that really make up the, um, the majority of the store. Uh, one of the ones that we've worked with in the past in Philadelphia, as was mentioned earlier, is Jetro. So we actually partnered with Jetro. Um, we got in touch with some of their um, the higher ups in the corporate office, and they actually agreed to make some changes in the items that they were stocking in Jetro. So they started to introduce more uh, low sodium canned uh, canned vegetables. <clears throat> light sugar canned fruits, and then they actually allowed us to put up magnets throughout the store which identified which of the items in the, in the, re, in the wholesaler um, were considered healthy items. So there were little magnets that said, um, this item is approved for the Philadelphia Healthy Corner Store Program. And that really makes it easier when a store owner is running into the, the cash and carry that they can identify exactly which items would be approved for our program. They can grab that case, put it in their, in their ba basket, and they know that that's a, a healthy approved item when they get back to the store. Um, then they, they know that these items are things that are uh, fall within the food uh, the product menu which identifies which items are healthy. And just some more examples of um, how we've sort of broken down the um, the products which store owners can choose from. So you know these are things like nuts, which um, which we we really try to avoid the ones that are high sodium. So as you can see down here, we kind of warn them against the ones that might be higher sodium. So the smoked ones sometimes have more salt. 
Um, and up here we give them examples of which ones would be considered healthy and which ones they can choose from for, um, for um, qualifying for the program. And again, just some more examples of healthier nuts that store owners can choose from. And then over here towards the end, uh, there's another distributor that we've actually identified. They're a nationwide uh, distributor. So they are called General Produce. Um, this one, yeah. <clears throat> The representatives we spoke with are, um, are from the California branch, but they actually do uh, distribute to the rest of the country. And they're a really interesting organization. So they do have a, a fairly high minimum uh, for drop-off. So they usually ask that stores buy 10 cases of produce. They seem to be willing to really work with us on that, um, and they have a very interesting business model. So they will actually go into the stores, they'll assess the landscape of the store, and then they'll really create a, a planogram for the store. So they'll start talking to the owner about um, you know, where they can uh, start putting fresh produce items so that customers will see them more easily. Um, they'll create a, a whole schematic for the store so that they, um, the store owner knows um, how they can really um, uh, have their customers see the produce items more easily. Uh, general Produce will also provide shelving for some of the stores in certain cases uh, so that they can display some of the products that, that they're buying. And again, just some more examples of healthy, uh, fun products, so little baby carrots. Um, they actually have a whole line of packaged salads, which they'll sell. And these are all through General Produce. Um, so they have these uh, prepackaged salads, which customers can just grab and go um, and have a healthy lunch option. And as Rhonda and Craig had mentioned, um, you know, this really does take a lot of cold calling. So it, it's a process in which you, you just call the distributors, um, you talk to them, you let them know what, uh, what you're trying to accomplish. Um, a lot of times you'll run into some resistance. So we've actually tried to partner, uh, we've, we've called, um, you know, some of the bigger junk food companies, so Frito-Lays and um, Coca-Cola, and most of the time you don't have much success with those companies. Although Coca-Cola, um, recently they started a program in certain parts of the country where they will provide stores with um, a shelving unit to display water. So they, their line of Dasani water, they actually um, have the, those at eye level and then underneath there's a basket which will, um, which you can put ice in in order to, uh, dis uh, to store some of the uh, produce items. So that's one, uh, one cool way that Coca-Cola is actually trying to make some changes in, in their, um, their model in order to encourage customers to buy some of these healthy items. And thank you, everybody. Great. Thank you for those informative presentations. I, I learned a lot um, from the work that's being done in New York and California, and I hope others on the call have found it informative. We actually have a lot of time for questions. So we're going to unmute the um, phone. Everybody should be unmuted unless they have muted themselves. We did receive one question by somebody typing it in, and they asked, um, is there an evaluation that shows whatever retailers are making, whenever retailers are making profits and when they switch, um, when they switch to healthy checkout? So if they're still making a profit when they switch to healthy checkout, are there any evaluations that show that? Okay. 
All of the speakers were accidentally muted, but they should be unmuted now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so, thanks. Oh, did you want to go ahead, Juan? No, go ahead, Rhonda. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to address a question about um, actual sales and profits in checkout lines. Uh, one thing that I'm going to say in our evaluation is that um, a large part of our evaluation is just trying to track the actual um, number of items that were sold. And what we really found is that the number of items that sell from the checkout line is significantly lower than I think any one of us really expected. And so when we talk about like the overall sales of products in a checkout line, if you're really taking away um, a couple dollars worth of sales a day, uh, in our mind it's not vastly affecting the bottom line of a large company like um, these candy companies. And this is, I'm stating this slightly preliminarily because we haven't fully assessed all of our um, data yet, but we really found that a very large, or very few number of people actually made a purchase at the checkout line. Um, and so I, I do think that's a huge selling point when you're talking to these uh, companies about um, changing it, is that they should know that. They should know what their sales is within the checkout line. Yes, and so what we found is that often we're simply just looking for the shortest line. So again, I mean, one of the reasons why we created that interior sign was to find people for purchasing healthier products in the line as opposed to you know, once the customer got to the checkout area, they're in a hurry, they're looking for the shortest line, and maybe if they were a little hungry or if they had children with them, they grab something, but, you know, generally trying to, to capture the standard profile of what people buy and how much they spend at a checkout, we, we found it, again, from a preliminary perspective, to be pretty low. And we did receive another question. Um, this one specifically for New York City. Um, what are the plans and prospects for scaling up the program across the city to include major chains? That is a very good question. Uh, as you can see, this program does cost some money, uh, both on materials end and on staffing in order to go out to the stores and do the work. Uh, it is something that we think is really important and it's valuable. Uh, we are just waiting on some direction within the agency, within the New York City Department of Health, to get the go-ahead to this. But uh, so far, you know, and that we're waiting for the results, basically. Um, and then we'll be able to present it to the commissioner. Uh, but we do hope to scale it up a little bit, but we don't really know exactly what that'll look like. But we will keep you posted. Um, and another question that we received, what percent of customers actually buy at the checkout? Well, this is this is what we can't state our numbers exactly, uh, but we will happily share that information once we have it. But it is a very low percentage, and it's definitely in the single digits with um, what our preliminary numbers look like. And then another question um, is, how are you addressing the use of targeted digital media, which is purposefully designed to foster decision making prior to checkout via mobile marketing? You want, you want to read the rest of the question, though? Yep. Um, this will accelerate in the next few years as hyper-local marketing becomes more widespread. The checkout decision making process will be bypassed. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question again? It was a little, little can, I, can I do it? Yes. I, th this, I think what you're doing, both of you, are, is fantastic. And I really support and applaud you. Um, but I wanted to know if you already are looking at um, the use of, of, of digital marketing. And, with, um, and in the context of what the food companies are doing, and the whole kind of shift to get people, because you're able now to geographically target outside the store in, 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 in real locations, both at, at the neighborhood and in, in the community level and inside the store. You're able, to, you're able to encourage purchasing decisions prior to walking into the store. That's the focus of the food industry today and the grocery store industry today. And to what extent are you looking at that now? 
In other words, I think that the check oh. that the checkout the checkout process is going to be Can replaced or severely challenged. I have I'm on a webinar right now and I have another one at eleven. Right. But I it adds actually Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So uh, I think we can kind of jump into this a little bit. Uh, one of the things that being done through digital marketing and social media really is about building brand loyalty, or, or at the very least, brand affinity. So making sure that you know you have your name out there, and that your target audience is affiliating you with particular types of lifestyles or particular types of attitudes, and it's really not so much about you know, affecting impulse buys because you're, you're building in something a product that people are going to buy regularly as opposed to at the checkout it's you have a captive audience that's waiting in line you know perhaps you have kids with you and it's really kind of a last minute thing you've already gone through several different sequences of the shopping experience by the time you get to the very last sequence which is the checkout and I think you know again digital marketing and, and social media really is focusing on you know, building up that expectation before the consumer comes to the store. How we would, combat that? Sorry? No, no, I would suggest to you that it's changing, and that's why I've asked that. I don't know if you read the grocery manufacturer's Google report that came out a few weeks ago. I, I can suggest that it's changing, that it's, that it's targeted to, to actual product sales now because they can deliver discount coupons and individual products and guide you to the store. So I, I, think, I hear what you're saying, but I'm, I guess I'm saying it's in transition now, and um, I'm glad you're looking at it. Yes, and I was actually just going to mention uh, digital coupons in conjunction with what you were discussing, and you're absolutely right. And there are a number of you know new ways to provide incentives. This is mostly being done through for-profit companies to people who are part of a given group, say a, a particular healthcare provider, or they work for a particular company, where you know digital incentives can be provided to purchase healthier products at the store, and you you know you can get a discount or you know some other incentive. And I, I think that's an interesting area to explore. We, we haven't gotten to that point yet, but I think, you know, in the future that could possibly be the battleground for where we try to, you know, stake our claim for influencing what people buy and influencing people purchasing healthier products. And, and one thing that's happened as well is uh, through our research of our distributor practices and meeting with the distributors in New York City, this does definitely not apply across the country, is that distributors in New York City are very um, frank with us in that marketing materials such as couponing um, does not work in New York City as it does around the country. I think around the country, I want to say it, there are numbers that it affects like 20 to 40 percent of purchases. Um, New York City people don't use coupons. There are many different theories on how it works, uh, but it, so for that reason, it, it isn't an area that we spend a lot of time and resources on. Thank you. Someone also typed in the question, um, is there an evaluation plan for the work in California? Uh, yes, actually. So right now we're in the process of um, uh, thinking about uh, retrofitting some of the cash registers, so creating uh, specific buttons which track uh, specific the items that are considered good to go. So we're, um, we're looking into really uh, tracking some of those sales, um, also working with store owners in order to create uh, a spreadsheet or some way that they can track the sales um, of, the, of the healthy items that they're introducing in their stores. Um, in uh, Philadelphia, we actually um, were able to purchase five point of sale uh, computer systems. So right, right now we're gathering data um, and really trying to analyze um, things like, you know, if we do a promotion or if we uh, put up specific types of marketing, how those affect the sales of, of the items that are being introduced by the store owners. And this is Rhonda and Craig. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about how it works with the point of sale? Because it, just so people know, like it is a very intensive process and it is a very resource heavy process to um, purchase those machines and to actually get into um, the proprietary information with these large distributors or large companies. 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's a huge time commitment and also a pretty large expense. Um, so I believe the, the computers themselves were um, around $6,000 per store. And then you um, you run into, um, as uh, Rhonda and Craig had mentioned, uh, all the products that these stores stock in, in uh, you know, in such a small space. Uh, you actually have to scan each of those items um, into the system. So um, each item each item has a specific SKU number, and then you really you have to input all the products that are in the store into the into the system. And then from there, um, you know, it, it is very intensive. Uh, and, and also um, the training that you provide to store owners usually takes quite a while to get them to learn how to use the systems uh, effectively, how to um, really um, utilize all the functions, so, um, so say uh, tracking what items are selling each week and things like that, it, you know, it really it takes a, quite a bit of time, um, you know, and we're, we're in about uh, year two of doing it in Philadelphia um, and still really, um, you know, still really kind of gathering that information so there's no specific, um, specific quantitative information that we have as of yet, um, but it, it is forthcoming. Uh, and one thing that I want to add is that we worked with a lot of distributors trying to use their existing point of sale um, system, so their cash register and asking for sales receipts. And that is a very uh, touchy and intensive subject, and it's something that as the Department of Health, we've wanted to know the sales um, even before we started doing these interventions. Uh, and it, it's a very complicated process, but I do think if, if anyone is able to create a great relationship with one of these larger companies uh, that are across the country, it would be a great thing to do some sort of analysis of how, much, um, how many items are purchased at the checkout line, uh, what percentage of those are healthy, unhealthy, um, and I, you know, I think we should put that out there, that that should be like the next evaluation on checkout lines. and really to get an idea and understanding beyond New York City, because New York City, of course, is a little different than the rest of the country, but like what the purchasing habits look at the check, look like at the checkout counter. And just to uh, follow up and give a description of what New York City is like, many of the stores are actually independently owned. So even though they market themselves under a common name, they're in a voluntary association with a particular distributor, they actually are independently owned. So their POS systems can vary widely from something that they got from a friend of theirs for five thousand dollars that maintains the software to, you know, top of the line. PR. But that, that was one of the challenges for us in getting data is the fact that there's virtually no universal POS system except for for the the handful of chains that are here in the city, and those stores unfortunately aren't in the neighborhoods that we've been targeting. Yeah, we've run into the same issues in both Philadelphia and um, in San Jose. It, just the wide variety of uh, different ty types of uh, tracking systems, and and just the I mean, a lot of the store owners we've worked with are just very, um, you know, they they write on the back of a, a box uh, before they go to a distributor. That's how they they track what the, what they need in the store. So going from that to to really a more sophisticated system uh, does take a lot of training and a lot of time. Yeah, I would say that writing on the back of the box must be a universal trait because we've seen that as well when <laughs> yep. we're at, at distributors. It's actually on the back of cigarette box. Cigarette box, yep, exactly. We were, we were trying to, we were seeing this all over, and we thought it was some uh -huh. sort of trend, and we realized that no, this is what it's been passed down through. I don't know some sort of institutional memory that this is how you track your inventory if you're a small store owner. <laughs> yep, absolutely. I've seen that all across the country. That that's just that's how they they track uh, what they need to stock. <laughs> and really informative. Are there any other questions from people on the phone? Hearing none, are there any announcements that uh, people on the phone want to make in regards to checkout or retail work they're doing in their communities? I did, I, this is Jeff Chester. I, we're not, I mean, we're tracking the use of digital to drive um, uh, product consumption, food and beverage product consumption, and, and tied to the payment systems that are emerging or that are available, like at Walmart, et cetera. But I do hope, uh, and Jessica, I think, has this, that you'll read the Google uh, Grocery Manufacturing Association report on the role of digital and how digital is transforming uh, food marketing, including at the convenience store level, because I think it lays out um, the challenge that we face 
um, over the next few years as um, product decision making um, uh, becomes integrated more into um, our digital media lifestyle. Hi, and, and this is Craig. Is that Jeff you said? Yes, Jeff Chester, Center for Digital Democracy. We do digital food marketing at, uh, work and, uh, here, and online privacy in, 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 in Washington. And you're, you're tracking the use of uh, digital payments we, linked with yeah, marketing? Yeah, not only we're tracking them, we have, you know, we're trying to regulate them. And, you know, okay. and, uh, and uh, we, we have a regulation on children's privacy online that we got through. But, um, but you know, the, if you look at what the food and beverage companies and the grocery stores and the convenience stores, they're all doing, they're all, they realize that young people and, and multicultural youth and mo multicultural moms, that you know, they're moving to make the decision-making process occur before you walk into the store and to create the incentives prior to walking into the store. And then, I mean, they have a whole system which you should look at. Google calls it path to purchase. Um, and it's a never-ending consumption loop. Um, and I think it, I think it challenges uh, how, we, uh, how I think it challenges us to come up with new ways to address that, because it's going to be personalized offers, inducements, because it's tied to your bank account. Ultimately, it'll be tied to your bank account, your debit card. They'll know precisely what your financial status is because of data profiling, big data. They know your race, your ethnicity, your exact location, what you buy, uh, you know, who your friends are through social media. It's a much more powerful marketing system that's now being deployed in food and beverage companies in the forefront of using all this stuff to sell the bad stuff. Absolutely. Including in New York. Then again, Walgreens and the pharmaceutical guys are doing a version of it as well. You know, so it's not just the food guys, but they're certainly in the forefront. I'm so glad you're part of this call. It's great to have a different perspective. Well, no, it's not a different perspective. I'm, I'm in awe of the work that you guys are doing. It's clearly the frontline work, but they are shifting their strategy. And and mm -hmm. and we need to be there and you know uh, for it and um, and this is why in you know the, the whole big data and privacy issues are all a part of it because they've been able to merge the data. Agri Look, Mond what I say Mondelez, Kellogg's, Kraft, um, they're data brokers now. I mean, I think that it in itself says how much this whole thing has changed. They are buying huge data sets to target individuals for their products. It's not just the axioms and the big credit bureaus. These guys are now in the data business because they know this is how things are sold in the 21st mm -hmm. century. And do you know, I know you said you're, you guys are in the process of collecting information, but do you know if they are using a universal strategy or are they tweaking the strategy when it comes no, to No, well, they're all, they're all doing the same thing. They're all doing the same things with, diff with different variations. Um, and it's interesting that the food and beverage companies are m much more um, uh, ag aggressive at it than, than than others, but they are in a t kind of cut as you better you know you know better than me a kind of economically cutthroat business, and that's why the the, the grocery manufacturers Google reports important because all their profits in the next ten years depend on digital only. But Can I the check the out that? What? Yeah, I sent out that report to the members of the Healthy Checkout subcommittee. You should have received Thanks. it on Monday with the reminder for this call. But if anyone hasn't received it, you can either. I didn't get it, for example. I don't know if I'm on the list, but the and I, but I, and I sent it to you. But the um, no, they're all doing they're all doing similar things. They've all bought the, and and uh, I'm happy to share with you. Maybe Jessica can send me your contact information. And I'll share with you a report that we just did for ICCR, a kind of confidential report that looks at, the, in part, the data strategies of all the food companies and, and how they're using it. Great. No, we, we would love to have that. And do you know if they've uh, done any sort of uh, distinction when it comes to targeting low-income communities? Well, they're, yeah, no, they're, they're, they're certainly targeting multicultural communities, and they're focused on low-income communities. I mean, Walmart's at the forefront of all this in many ways. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if, 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 you know, if you haven't looked at Walmart Labs, you should because it is so interesting. I mean, they have um, uh, created their technology, bought, brought all these big data experts in to really push the envelope. And because Walmart's also a provider of financial services, they're able to tie in, this is what's going to happen now, they're able to tie in actual financial information. They know when your paycheck comes in, they know when you need the money the most, and they can target, they can target you. So this is happening across the income sphere. 
We're going to have to wrap up this call. We have an, another uh, webinar that's immediately following us at 2 o'clock on Kids Meals, which is also part of the Food Marketing Work Group. But I wanted to say before we wrap up that the next call we had talked about doing, um, talking about behavioral economics and sort of making a public health case for Healthy Checkout. So if people on the call have ideas, um, if you yourself are an expert on this field or you know folks who are, who we should be inviting to that meeting, um, please get in touch with me. This is Jessica at CSI. And let me know who you would be interested in inviting to um, speak on those topics for our next call. Thank you to Rhonda and Craig and Juan for their really interesting and informative presentations. And as I was saying before, if you didn't receive the, um, the study that Jeff was talking about, which I included in a reminder that I sent Monday to the subcommittee, please get in touch with me, and I'm happy to resend it. Thanks, so thanks to everyone on the call. Thanks, thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thank, you. thanks everybody, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.